So yeah, I'm Mike McCann, and I want to give you some kind of overview of what people are doing with CNNs for inverse problems. And before that, I'll introduce the biomedical imaging group at EPFL. So it's led by Mikhail Unzer there in the middle. And then most of this work is in collaboration with Kyung Hwan Jin over at the side. And this guy, non-human, is our sort of sad attempt at making a cubic beast spline. And the joke here is that Mikkel Unzer is, is an expert in splines, and therefore splines are sort of lurking underneath everything that we do, although I don't think I'll explicitly talk about splines anywhere here. So that's the team. And then the group does a variety of things. So uh, we're interested in medical imaging, biological imaging, and then also doing theory. And then we have sort of a variety of tools, splines, wavelets, stats, mathematical imaging, and these are just cartoons, maybe don't make so much sense, but I'll point to a couple. That's the famous Shep and Logan, which you can't escape if you're doing MRI reconstructions, etc. This is an MRI phantom made out of splines, and it's much more realistic and kind of interesting because you can take real analytical MRI measurements off of that guy. And here's some B splines, and the cubic spline is in there somewhere. And then lately, our focus has been on doing image reconstruction uh, as part of this ERC grant. And the idea is you can make a core of forward models and solvers and software and uh, cost functionals, and then use these to solve a wide variety of biomedical problems. I think in, we've seen in previous talks that you could think of MRI and CT and many of these other things as being very closely related to each other. So there's this large stable of problems that we're interested in. And I've been working mostly over here, phase contrast tomography and tomography in general, positron emission tomography, et cetera. Uh, so one slide about inverse problems, and we get to the CNNs. So the way we think about this is that you have an image, which for us is a continuous function of space and time. That's the x in the equation. And then physics acts on that. That's h. And it acts in some incredibly complicated way. It's nonlinear. We may not even know exactly how the physics works. And then out comes discrete measurements. That's the y. And I'm also separating out here noise, which is also some complicated nonlinear thing we may not know anything about. And the goal is to reconstruct some image from those measurements. Okay? And, and the, the running example here is always tomography. That's what I know about. So this is a sinogram, 3D sinogram. And this is one slice of reconstruction. And I think it's safe to say that the dominant approach to doing this is to form some kind of uh, objective function, so some data fit and some regularizer. There's some subtle things going on with notation here. So I've already switched my x from a script to a, a vector. So I'm going to use bold for vectors. It doesn't matter so much. But you need to do something like this. Why is there a regularizer? Well, in sort of almost every inverse problem, you're ill-posed, and so you need to select from this an infinity of solutions, and so you can do that with a regularizer. This is still a very general thing. You obviously can't implement this. And then here's one specific choice for that f and g, so just least squares data fit, least squares regularizer, and then there's another sort of sneaky modelization step here, and actually this is where kind of all the work goes, is going from the physics to, you hope, a linear operator that's close enough to the original physics that what you get out of this thing, the reconstruction applied to y, is at least reasonably close to what went into it. OK, so now we, we take a total detour from that. We'll come back to inverse problems. Now I want to try to tell a story about CNNs. And this is the audience participation point. So, so what is this? A cello. A cello, yes, that's a cello. It's a, a good question already. I think there's two cellos there. We won't do too many of these, so play along. What's this? But more specific. Green out. Even more specific? Granny Smith. Granny Smith. Yes, that's a Granny Smith. Good question. OK, I didn't come up with these labels myself. OK, I'm told that that's a Granny Smith. How about this? Pheasant is very close. More specific. Ptarmigan is also good. Yeah, this thing might actually have many names. Uh, I'm told this is a rough to grouse. So I don't think there's anyone in the audience that would look at that and say that's a rough grouse. So does anyone, does anyone get a flavor of what we're doing here? Yeah. 
this is the ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge, or at least a piece of it. So this is a challenge that's been running since 2010. And it's a collection of these tasks. Um, look at an image, tell me what's in it, or where is the thing inside of it. And then you have these fun scoreboards. So different teams, different submissions, and some kind of accuracy. And then specifically, we were doing the localization challenge. So in the, in this is one of a few different challenges. You have a thousand classes, as you saw there, they're very specific, some of them, oddly so. It's a lot of dog species, bird species, monkeys, some other things. Uh, you get 1.2 million labeled images, so a lot of training data. You get 50,000 validation images, which are essentially just more training data. And then there are 100,000 test images, which are unseen and hidden by the people who run the challenge. So you submit labels for those 100,000 test images. And uh, you were supposed to say what's there and where is it. I'm kind of ignoring the where. I think that part's relatively easy. And you're judged in a very kind way, which is that you get five guesses. And if sort of if any of your guesses are right, then you've got the image correct. So here's the kind of way people present these results. Uh, it's the image. This is the true label. It's a salt shaker. Here's my top five guesses. OK, in this case, I didn't get it right. You can see that it kind of makes sense what's being guessed. but. Turns out these kind of images are very hard because the networks don't read text very well. OK, so then here's a plot of the results from 2012 to 2017. I don't have the 2010 because the competition changed a little bit between 2010 and 2012. But anyway, in 2012, here was the, the second, this is the second runner up. This is the way like I would have approached the problem in 2012. And this is just keywords from the description. One versus rest, linear SVM, dense features, 135,000 dimensional representation of the images. And this is their error on that 100,000 test images, so something like 50%, which is actually pretty good if you have 1,000 classes. But now here is the, the first, this is the winner of that year. This is the first neural network coming to this problem. And it's remarkable because it has all, all of the things that you see in neural network research now. We're already here. So it's deep. Lots of parameters, 60 million parameters. Uh, you need GPUs, and you still need a lot of time. So two GPUs for a week of training. And then there's mysterious training tricks that are necessary to get the kind of accuracy you're seeing. But this is a massive jump in performance. And then every year after, essentially all of the submissions were CNNs. Uh, partly because you can share the code very easily. So it's very low entropy in the submissions. And performance continued to increase quite a bit. And I think it's interesting. Human performance is somewhere here, about 5%. This is pretty hard to measure. You, you need to get a grad student or a postdoc to actually learn these classes themselves, because you can't do it just as a layman. And then you need to get them to label some significant portion of 100,000 images. It also takes an incredible amount of time. So, so there's an interesting blog post by the guy who got here. But so this problem, I would say, is sort of essentially solved. I mean, you, you're definitely on par with human performance, and maybe we'll get even better. OK, I think I'll skip to what is a CNN. We had some nice slides about that before. Um, so why do we care about all of that? But you could say, well, they have an amazing technology that really solved the heck out of this localization problem. Uh, but maybe we can use it in our problem. So this thing's kind of like an inverse problem, right? You, you could have a thousand long binary vector where you have a one on the, on the cello spot. And then there's some very complicated process that generates this image of a cello. And they just showed that you can use neural networks to go backwards, to go from this image uh, back to this x. So you say, aha, we have a great new idea uh, for doing inverse problems. So here's, here's an example of such. Uh, Lena here, blurred Lena, inverse filtering, and then the neural network approach. But unfortunately, it's not exactly, it's not exactly a new approach. <laughs> okay, so this is from 88. Uh, and I put this here because sort of every conversation about neural networks has to include this little fact that, oh, they're old, and they've had these cycles where people got really excited for one reason or another, and then they got discarded, and then backpropagation came, and they got excited again, and they got discarded. So 
this sort of thing has been tried before. The other point that I want to make here is that it's it's not quite strictly fair to call this thing a neural net. If you look into this paper, what you see is it's not convolutional, it's not even feed forward, and in fact there's no training involved here. So this is a neural network, but it's not machine learning. So you want to be a bit careful with the terminology. If you say deep networks are very successful, that could include a huge range of, of actual algorithms. So what I'm talking here, I'm going to restrict myself to CNNs, which have a specific form, which we've talked about, and uh, not so much these kinds of things. So we got, we got interested in seeing what are people actually doing with these big convolutional networks for inverse problems. And so we have a survey paper on that from last year. And we looked at problems where there was already some published research. So at that time, there was lots and lots of stuff on archive and not so much that was peer reviewed. Um, so we picked. These problems, these are problems that are near and dear to signal processing people. Uh, the first three are sort of classic signal processing inverse problems, and the last two are more medical imaging type problems. And the question was kind of like, if I want to get involved in using CNNs for my favorite inverse problem, what, where should I start? What things should I try? Like, how do I train? How do I make the architecture? How do I actually learn? So I'm going to go through some, some answers to these questions. So before that, just to systematize a little bit, the top is the, we'll call the objective function formulation, which is how I think most people were solving inverse problems. So if you want to reconstruct why you solve a minimization problem, and you spend all your time crafting these different pieces. In a learning formulation, you do something very different. You're still solving a minimization problem, but the result is not a reconstruction of one image. It is a function that reconstructs any image from the measurements. So that's this, this is the R. That's the result of your minimization. You're minimizing over the parameters for that thing. So that's the weights in your neural network. And then you need a training set in order to do this. So you need pairs of measurements, Yn's and Xn's. You need a measure of loss between the reconstruction and the ground truth. And typically, you want to regularize, but now you're regularizing on the parameters of this function rather than on anything related to the images. So this is recasting the whole problem. And also, you know, there are problems that you can solve this way that you can't solve this way because the bottom one requires training. So this is fundamentally like a different, it's a different game that you're playing now. OK, so then what kind of performance are people getting with this? Is it even worth trying? So. For denoising, it's probably the place where you can see the trends the most clearly because this is really well studied and everybody is denoising like Lena and Peppers and Mandrill. So these same images come up in almost every paper. And there's this 2016 survey that says BM3D from 2007 is kind of still the king. Uh, it can be beaten in certain noise levels on certain images, but by and large, this is the best way to denoise that we know about. Then in 2017, you have a bunch of papers, actually, that show results like this. So BM3D over here at 30 or you know, 25 decibels SNR. And you gain about 1 dB using your neural network. So this is pretty impressive for people that are doing uh, signal processing. You know, to beat BM3D sort of soundly like this is not easy. And there's a lot of people doing it. Um, so. 30 plus half a dB sort of thing is what you're getting on denoising, which is pretty impressive. When you look at the other things, you get smaller improvements like this, 1 dB on the sort of more signal processing things, super resolution, deblurring. When you go to MRI and CT, there's not really standard test sets, so you can see sort of bigger improvements. But definitely it's plausible that people are getting 2 dBs over sparsity, over dictionary learning, over any of these things. No. None of these things are real. So, so what I mean by that is all of these have kind of the simplest possible model that you could imagine would be called X. So in denoising, I mean, the forward operator is the identity, and then there's Gauss. Super resolution, you know, pixels. Um, what else do I have here? Deblurring, you know the kernel. And then MRI and CT, you can use these simples like MRI equals Fourier transform. 
stuff away. And CT, there's kind of no simple dumb way, but you can do that. So, yes, that's a caveat, which I'll talk about more. Some other kind of interesting trends, there are a few cases where you have a group that proposes a method, they get some impressive result, they gain a half a dB on something, and another group comes and they just make the network bigger. So they, the layers are now bigger, there's more filters, it's deeper, and they gain another half dB. So this is an interesting research program to begin with. It's just like my computer is bigger than yours, maybe because it's two years later or something, and I can gain even more. It, so it's interesting. Then uh, there's a lot you could argue about here. Does it really matter? So if you're doing denoising and you're going from 30 to 30 and a half dB, you're not seeing this by eye. So 30 dB is already like it looks perfect to you. So in some sense, you could say, OK, I don't care about this. On the other hand, I mean, the, study, the problem's incredibly old. And getting gains like this is pretty impressive. So you know, something is working here. Uh, speed is interesting. So the, the networks are always going to be small convolutions and these simple nonlinearities. So whatever you learn is going to be fast to evaluate. So maybe you take two weeks to learn, but then you take you know, milliseconds to evaluate because you're just doing tiny convolutions. So even like at this point in MRI, nobody was showing massive gains over TV or whatever else, but they were showing big gains in speed because dictionary learning, whatever, is very slow. But they were learning something that's kind of similar performance, but you have you know, millisecond execution times. So this is another interesting direction. Then the last one, uh, denoising is kind of a special problem because inside other inverse problems, you often have sort of a denoising step. Inside ADMM, if you're doing TV, you soft threshold gradients. You could think of that as denoising, and there's a little bit of work on just taking an off-the-shelf denoiser and throwing it inside ADMM, and you get some kind of interesting regularizer. And so if you have a good denoising CNN, you might be able to deploy that for a wide variety of other problems. So these, the, the, denoising is maybe a, a good one to be studying. Okay. So then the next thing is, how do I actually train these? Because in ImageNet, you can generate the labels according to some oracle, which is basically humans. In inverse problems, you certainly don't have this kind of oracle. I can't look at a sinogram and then draw the original you know, distribution. So you have to play some kind of tricks. Now, when the forward models are really simple, it's like in denoising, it's very easy to make training data. I just go to ImageNet, I take natural images, then I put noise on them myself, and then I learn the regression that goes from noisy to clean. So that's easy enough to do in these cases. Medical imaging is a little bit more tricky. So the way out that most people are using here is that for a while, we've been interested in doing low-dose medical imaging. And, and maybe the reason for that is that if you, have high, if you have high enough dose, there are very simple methods that give you very good reconstructions. So there's almost no reason to be studying you know, high-dose medical imaging. You can just do the sort of simplest linear thing. So what you actually want to do is medical imaging from low dose. And so the way that you train is you take high dose sinogram. So I can say I take a thousand views. This is what you might do in micro CT or something else. I use filtered back projection, which is the simplest reconstruction algorithm, but it works really well because I have lots of views. That gives me this xn. Now I want to make the corresponding low view yn, and so I just throw away the data that I had. And now I have my pair. So you're using your old, your old knowledge about how to reconstruct to make your training data. That seems to be the dominant paradigm right now. And then just to mention that all of this stuff, there's lots of inverse crime going on here. That is, you're making training data using exactly the same model that you're going to invert. It kind of makes sense, but there might be gotchas. So I mean, if you're reviewing something or thinking about this for your own work, you have to be careful. And you might want to think about adding some noise or somehow perturbing this H between when you learn and when you test. At least it's an interesting question that if I train on H1, and then when test comes around, H has drifted a little bit to H2, is my performance going to drastically decrease, or do I have some kind of robustness there? OK, and then this goes back to an earlier question, I think, a little bit, is 
most of the approaches are not just taking measurements and going measurements directly to reconstruction. You can do that for denoising, but in cases even like um, super resolution, it, the network could potentially take a small image, 128 by 128, and upscale it to 256 by 256. But I haven't seen anybody do that. What they do is take the image, they upsample it themselves, they interpolate linearly, and then they put that into the network. So you're still going 256 to 256. The network is just sort of cleaning things up. So the sense is that that's kind of what works well. So here's a, just a cartoon about different ways you could pre-process. So you, you have your training X, you make your measurements. You could just throw that directly into the CNN. It seems like because no one's publishing about that, it doesn't work very well. But we'll see. Maybe there's stuff coming out. The simplest thing, if you want these just to be back into image space, is just to back project them. So this is actually like zero filling for MRI. And here it is for CT. Throw that into the CNN. Maybe if you want to give your CNN an even a little bit easier job, you do some kind of inverse. Or you could even do some kind of other uh, reconstruction technique and then throw it into your CNN. So these things are mostly what people do. Then you can say, well, this is kind of silly because now you're just denoising. You know, it's, if my paper is CNNs for MRI reconstruction, but really I use Fourier transform for MRI reconstruction, and then I use CNN to denoise that. It seems like you're cheating a little bit. Okay, I, I kind of agree with this criticism. But one thing to note, at least, is that the noise that you're talking about removing is highly structured. So it's not just like an IID Gaussian that the, the network is taking away. For instance, here, if you're using filtered back projection, you get these nasty like line artifacts that come from having not enough views and your CNN needs to remove those things. So yes, it's a kind of restoration, but it's not sort of just trivially denoising. OK, then how much training do you need would be another question. And this is kind of a tricky question to answer. So when we were looking at these papers, the people doing medical imaging tend to have very few data sets and very, very few training images. So you're talking about hundreds, which seems like a little bit low. Because you know the numbers we were talking about before is 1.2 million training images. Now you're telling me that okay, I'm going to try it with 100. You know, I'm going to try it with 100 slices of MRI. But this is this is okay. People are going this low. In denoising, people go higher because it's much easier to get data. This is complicated by the fact that you can also split images into patches, so you don't really know how many training images you get when you try to survey these things. You know, I, I was going to try to make like a table that would say, yes, here's the distribution of how many training images you have. But making this thing is very difficult because the descriptions are sort of so unclear. So this is very rough. OK, 100,000 patches or 100,000 images may be split into patches. You can also do augmentation. I think this is a really a good idea, which is that if you have things, if your problem is invariant to certain things, then you can bake those invariances into the training. So for instance, if you know how to rotate your image, and then rotate the measurements in a corresponding way. Then you can take your 100 training images, you can rotate them, and add those back into the training set. So you multiply the training by a lot. And this, this sort of essentially bakes the invariance into the network. Uh, and then the last one here is you can also get away with a lot less training data if you use pre-trained things, pre-trained networks, which you can get online. So you let somebody else do the two weeks on their NVIDIA GPUs. And then you, you have the network architecture. Maybe it's even for a slightly different problem. You change the beginning a little bit so that it fits your data dimensions. You change the end a little bit so it fits your data dimensions. And you initialize the weights with the pre-trained weights. And then you do some more training APOCs with your data. And this thing works quite well in practice. So the one that we saw was they want to do video super resolution. It's kind of obvious that you could train with image super resolution. So they do something like that, train with images, switch to video. They get away with much fewer videos than presumably you need otherwise. OK. So then how do you pick the actual architecture? So the, the training set kind of fixes the input and the output side. But then you have to decide what goes in between. I think the, the first step is always you just pick the simplest convolutional thing like you would see in anybody's diagram. So you 
you take five layers, you take X number of filters per layer, and you try that. That gives you some kind of baseline. And there are people doing that. It seems like more success is had uh, by adapting other people's networks. <laughs> Maybe this is just easier, but you see networks coming up again and again. We also do this. So here's the UNet, which is gaining a lot of popularity in uh, biomedical imaging. And here's another sort of simple architecture. So it's basically a big design space, and you probably don't want to get too involved in picking these things yourself. So <laughs> you just want to get something that works. OK, so that was that. Something simple, something that's already worked. And then there's some really interesting approaches. These things are not quite CNNs, uh, but they're quite interesting. So it's, it's where you use this unrolling idea to actually do your, your architecture design. So an example is I'm solving some inverse problem. I look at my iteration of ISTA. So this is an iterative method that gives me sparsity on these coefficients. And I blur my eyes a bit and I say, OK, What's happening is I'm taking coefficients, I'm doing something linear, I'm adding something, and I'm thresholding. So if I write the block diagram, it's like I'm doing something linear, adding something, thresholding, doing something linear, adding something, and thresholding. And then I say, well, instead of using this particular linear operation, I'm just going to parameterize this by some weights. And instead of adding this, I'm going to parameterize this by some other weights. And I'm going to use gradient descent to learn those things. So there are people doing this with ISTA, of course, and other people in the audience know a lot more about that than I do. But there are people doing this also with ADMM and other things. They kind of just take some iterative algorithm and say, OK, if I'm going to run that for 10 iterations, it's just a network with X number of layers. And the kind of neat thing is that you can initialize those weights with the correct weights. So you can initialize with these filters. If you run gradient descent, of course, your training error can't be worse than your training error would have been using the original. So there's some kind of, this is sort of attractive. OK, then a little bit about how do you actually formulate the learning problem, and then how do you solve it? So this was very general with no selection for the cost and no selection for the regularizer. Predominantly, people are using Euclidean here. They don't think too much about that, I don't think. Uh, some papers use L1. Some people think L1 is better. I, I mean, obviously, it should depend on what problem you're working on. But OK, we don't worry too much about that. Uh, there's lots of different regularizers. <coughs> you certainly need this. Let's see, did I say anything about Dropout? Uh, dropout is actually one of these regularizers. So the mysterious training thing I mentioned at the beginning inside of the image recognition challenge is dropout, which is a way of regularizing a neural network where you just turn off neurons in the middle of training. So you just sort of forget about them and set them to zero, then let them come back. And this seems really heuristic, but actually there's a little bit of nice theory behind that, and this thing really works. And I mean, I don't want to go so much into this stuff, but I think anybody that worked on this knows that it's not trivial to get the thing to converge. It takes a little bit of magic. And sometimes these little tweaks, like whether you use dropout or not, matter a lot. So this is the kind of the dark side is, is right here. And how do you formulate this? And then also on the next slide, how do you actually optimize this? Obviously, non-convex. And uh, the good thing is that there's plenty of software packages that essentially do it for you. So you're not writing your own gradient descent. But there's still the question of how do I tweak this thing, learning rates, et cetera, et cetera, to get convergence. The, the secret inside scoop that, that I heard at EPFL, OK, you know, Google has people doing these big networks at each HRIC. And they said the Google heuristic is like, you train for a week. If it converges, it's going to work. If it doesn't, you throw it away. So <laughs> I mean, this is, this is about as far as I think they've gotten with that. Uh, overfitting is a problem. I think it's much less of a problem when you're doing inverse problems because you're doing a regression. And at least what we've found is it's very hard to get overfitting. You're learning a much more complicated function. Instead of like uh, image in and label out, it's image in, image out. And so overfitting may be not too much of a problem for us. The question is actually just learning a function that's even close to what you want. OK, then this, 
I think everybody's interested in why do they work. I don't think anybody has a great theory about it. I just want to like point in a few directions, and I think there are probably many more. And I think we've already heard much deeper things about this. So we heard about universal function approximations. Uh, I think maybe that's not so interesting in terms of why they work. You have to explain things about how do you actually learn the function. I mean, even if the function that you want to learn is in the class that you can learn, you still don't know that you're going to get there. And then you have no free lunch uh, that says that, that all algorithms should be the same when you average them over all testing data. So if you want to say something about why are CNNs good, you can't say it in a, just a general statement about they're good on everything. They can only be good in certain places. So you have to say something, I, I think at least, about an interaction between data and CNNs. Uh, unrolling is a very interesting way to look at CNNs. And we've heard stuff about that already. And then another nice thing, invariance. I think there, most CNNs are more or less shift invariant. <laughs> be very careful in saying this. They're not going to be exactly shift invariant because maybe you downsample in other things. But a lot of problems in imaging are shift invariant in some way. And then we've heard about the scattering transform, which is a way to think about how CNNs are invariant to other things than just shifts. And that's very compelling for images as well, because most, at least when you're talking about image classification, diffeomorphism shouldn't change the label. So these are, some, these are promising things that don't explain you know, the whole story, but they're definitely going in the right direction. Uh, I'm sure other people can add lots of critiques. And if you want to add a critique, <laughs> you're welcome to. But here are some of the ones that we came up with or read other people talking about. So a simple one, when you review these things, it's very tricky because there's not sort of a standard block diagram for CNNs. So you get sort of every author just comes up with their own way of describing what they're doing. Uh, for example, in that UNET, uh, you know, as a signal processing person, you read the block diagram and it's kind of making sense to you. Okay, skipping you know, three by three convolutions and upsampling. And then you get to this one by one convolution, which for signal processing people, you're just like, what's going on? You know, one by one convolution is a scalar multiplication. It makes no sense. And you realize that actually there's multiple channels that are sort of hidden inside the block diagram. So this is not really one by one. And what they mean by convolution isn't even really convolution. It's sort of multi-layer convolution. So It'd be nice to clear up these kind of things. It would make the stuff more reproducible. Of course, you can also just take their code and run it. So it's not a problem. Um, I think most people have GPUs now, so it's not such a big deal. But you could imagine you know, Google running something and saying, look, at I have these great results, but nobody else can run my code because it takes my, my server farm. It's a little bit unsatisfying. So this is a problem of reproducibility. Uh, just how is the research going to move forward? I, uh, the, the learning is very tricky. So as I say, there's lots of tweaking that goes into the learning. So even if I give you my architecture and I say, this works great for me, maybe you can't get it to converge uh, on your data. So this is a bit scary. And in, when you do convex optimizations, we have this great thing, which is that how you minimize doesn't matter at all. And when you, pr when you propose a new convex optimization problem, anybody can solve it. They're all going to get the same answer, right? But you don't have that here, actually. Both how you formulate that thing and how you solve it are coupled and change the answer that you get. This makes comparisons difficult because if I want to compare two architectures, how do I know that you know, mine just converged to a better local minima than yours? Maybe your architecture is still better. There's that we were reading somebody that was comparing uh, L2 costs and L1 costs in the cost functional for learning. And the results that they get are that L1 learning is better even with regard to L2 loss on the training. So results like this make really no sense. I mean, you're optimizing one thing on training, and, and then you compare it. I mean, your, your figure of merit on testing is something different, and it's better than directly optimizing that thing. And they try to explain sort of post hoc, ah, it's because of these reasons, but it's a little bit unsatisfying. Uh, so this, this is tricky. Uh, then th we'll move into the range of opinions. I would say, if you're presenting me with a paper that is completely atheoretical, so it's just, I made this network, I tried it on this data, here are my results, then I would say that the barrier for 
how good the experiments have to be should be much, much higher. So you really have to ask, do I care about this experiment? Is it done correctly? Because if that's not true, then you essentially learn nothing from the paper. So uh, there's that. And just some fun things. This is our data, so I'm going to poke fun at, at ourselves. Here's a full view reconstruction of some uh, bone. And there's a little spur of bone here. Here's a total variation reconstruction. So it has this nice star staircasing. And it's a little bit over smooth, but you still see the bone. You're at 21 uh, dB of SNR. Here's the neural network. You're at 23, but the bone is gone. <laughs> so this gets into the, can we trust these things? Uh, maybe SNR isn't the right metric. Uh, this is another version of kind of the same thing. Here's um, profiles from an image. You have ground truth. It's this wiggly thing. TV smooths it. Uh, same ground truth. Here's the neural network. So the neural network actually looks very sharp because it has all these high frequencies, but they are different high frequencies than the ground truth. Again, okay, I think actually uh, Yvonne's talk had some of, I mean, this was kind of the point there was that in some sense, this is good. You're learning kind of what these wiggles should look like and you get a different realization. But you might not want something like that. And then some next ideas here. Uh, CNN work has diffused sort of to the easiest places first, and then the next step will be a little bit harder places. So 3D is hard because the graphics cards don't have that much memory. So you have to think a little bit about how you would do that. But of course, all the biomedical inverse problems are 3D. You definitely want to go there. Plus time makes it even worse. There's a whole range of other biomedical inverse problems and other inverse problems that you could definitely move to, but they take a little more domain knowledge. So it's kind of up to us to do if we want to do that. Um, let's see, cross-task learning is a big deal. So that's, I want to train in one setting and then I want some robustness to changes in noise levels or slight, um, you know, if my hardware drifts a little bit. So this is again our data. Um, let's see, you train with 40 dB of SNR in your measurements. And when you test, here's the CNN, you get these nice results. So you're beating dictionary learning, you're beating TV. Uh, by a little bit. But if you change the amount of noise in your measurements, either reducing the noise in your measurements or increasing, the CNN starts to tank a bit. So you're, you're not better. And this isn't a huge change either. So you know, figuring out how to deal with this and having a knob that you can turn on your CNN to deal with these problems is an important thing. Uh, then, of course, GANs are, I guess, what everyone starts thinking about after they get bored with CNNs. The setup is kind of like this. Uh, numerous problems, you have your measurements. The generator, in our case, is the guy that goes from measurements to reconstruction. The discriminator is another CNN. Its job is to go from reconstructions to a classification. It tries to note when the reconstruction is a fake, a fake one made by the generator and when the reconstruction is real data from training. So this is a really cool idea. This is incredibly hard to, to train properly. And there's like obvious problems like modal collapse and things. And the discriminator can just memorize the training set and then it has, it's perfect. So this is a cool idea, hard to do in practice, and there's lots of tweaks on that. So I have like three minutes. So I'll go quickly through some of our ideas here. So doing CNNs for computed tomography. So the big idea with FPP CompNet is uh, many iterative methods involve this normal operator. It's the thing you see when you write a normal equation. In many problems, HGH is a convolution. So when you think about the unrolling style, that linear operation would be a convolution itself. And so maybe that means CNNs could be good for these problems. So here's the normal operator appearing to greater percent. Look at that. I, you can write down situations that will make that normal operator shift invariant, though it's true for all of the cases I was talking about already. It's true. Many of those are obvious. So denoising is obviously shift invariant. Uh, X-ray CT is not so obvious, but known in the community. 
here's the normal operator, the impulse response of the normal operator for x-ray CT. So that would make sense that you get rays coming out of it. So when you look at ISTA, you have that linear operator. That's the normal operator. That means that's a filtering operation. So why not replace that with a filter? So that's the sort of motivation for why you would use CNNs at all for this problem. Let's see. And then the filter back projection part is actually in any case where you have this shift invariant normal operator. Actually, well, in all cases, you can write things like this. But in any case where you have the shift invariant normal operator, you can do a filtering like reconstruction. So filtered back projection comes from the CT literature. That's the sort of discretized version of the continuous inverse. We can also think about it as uh, this, inverting this matrix. So you always have this available to you. So what this means is there's a class of problems, which we sort of characterize partly at least, where the normal operator is shift invariant and where there's a filtered back projection over it. And so the FFP, ComNet is, you always have access to this, you run that, then you put that thing into your convolutional neural network, and you get your reconstruction. So that's the UNet, that's the architecture we use. I think these things are pretty clear. Just show some results. So we have like three different experimental setups, actually, which I guess I'll say quickly. This is, these are realistic looking images, but it's synthetic for a so we make the sinograms ourselves. And this is good because now we have the, the true ground truth. So we go from image, we make the sinogram, and we reconstruct. Here's the, the original filter back projection doesn't work very well because we're doing low views. This is total variation. This is total variation. It's very carefully tuned. In fact, we parameter sweep on the testing image. So this is the best, as far as, as, far as I can understand, this is the best you could ever get TV to do on this image. This is just the limitation of that formulation. And then here's the FPP comp net, so you're getting 4 dBs of a natural image like this, and it's probably hard to see, but you do get this nice light sharpness. <clears throat> Here is real data, so we don't make the sinograms. This is from microtomography experiment. The problem here is you don't have ground truth, but we play the same trick that I discussed before. So you have full view reconstruction, so you use that as the ground truth. That's how we get SNRs. Uh, FPP is not working very well. Again, the max you could get with TV, and you get some really nice improvements in sharpness using this convolutional neural network. The last one, which I'm actually pretty proud of here, is here it's analytical forward projections of ellipsis. So you write it in closed form, so the model is exact. And here TV wins significantly. So what's, what's good about this is that if TV is ever going to be the right regularizer, it should be for images like this. So if you really had a result that FPP or any kind of convolutional network is beating TV here, it's highly suspicious. Because like this, this ground truth should actually be the minimizer of the cost function you're writing down, you know, that you're getting. So this is a nice sanity check that you can't do magic with the convolutional neural network. And it also tells you that probably what's going wrong here, it's not so much the data term. The data term's probably okay. Yeah, do, you, do you use the Oracle, you know, do you try to do you try to uh, you know, the We don't formulate it that way, but I think you would get that. So what's happening is it's like, it's a golden ratio search that just finds the highest SNR. Yeah, but it's like, it's a golden ratio search that just finds the highest SNR. So we know we're finding the highest SNR. And I think that should be equivalent to what you're, doing, what you're saying. But actually, I think it's a good suggestion. I think it would be the better way to pick it. But yeah, I mean, you would expect that the TV norm should be sort of exactly equal to the perimeter of all of these things, modular discretization, and a few other little details. Yeah. So I'd say, I think what's going here, what's going wrong here is pretty clearly the regularizer. And I think nobody would claim that TV is like the one best regularizer for doing biomedical images. They're obviously not piecewise constant. So it seems like that's where most, most of the gain is coming from. Okay, so uh, in summary, we have a little bit of theory on why 
there are some inverse problems where CNNs might be good and others where they might not be good. So we think like structured illumination microscopy, it's not shift invariant at all, maybe CNN won't work. Uh, we get nice reconstructions, especially on realistic data. The thing is very sensitive to noise, it takes a long time. 